in the first half of the 6th century BC at a city of ancient Egypt called Tephanes, a wedding took place. The bride was a princess of the royal house of Judah and the groom was a soldier in the pay of Egypt, a prince of the Milesians, a people from the eastern Mediterranean, men who were fighters, colonizers, traders, venturing by sea and land all over the then known world. If we ask ourselves what was the significance of this wedding all those years ago, we have to go forward in time, forward some two and a half thousand years to this, the Royal Abbey of Westminster in London, the Royal Peculiar, where stands the coronation chair and the coronation stone on which for centuries have been crowned the sovereigns of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. But for this story, we also have to go back in time, back to a day recorded in the Old Testament, when Jacob, blessed as the heir of Isaac and fleeing from the land of Canaan and from the anger of his elder brother Esau, stopped in the open to sleep, making use of a stone for his pillow. And there dreamed a dream which filled him with awe, a dream in which he saw a stairway up to heaven with angels ascending and descending the dream of Jacob's ladder, and at the head, God himself. When he awoke in the morning, stunned by his experience, he anointed with oil the stone he had used as a headrest, and called the place Bethel, the house of God, so that the stone became the stone of Bethel, the stone of destiny. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee, and in thy seed, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. An anointed stone, the enduring witness to God's covenant with man. This stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. So Jacob went on his way from Bethel, from Canaan, northwards to his ancestral lands in Haran, to the home of his uncle Laban. There he settled, met and married two wives, Leah and Rachel, and raised a family of twelve sons and a daughter. But he still looked on Canaan as his real home, and at last he and his folk set out to return to Canaan. But on the way, an angel of God came to wrestle with him, and they fought, and Jacob won. And so God gave to him the name of Israel, one who prevailed with God. No longer Jacob the supplanter, but Israel, a prince with God. So it was that as Jacob and his family came back to Canaan, he made his way to that same spot where he had dreamed of his God. And there, God reaffirmed his covenant with him. In thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. But if Canaan was to be his home for most of his life, Jacob was destined not to die there. Away to the southwest, across the Sinai Desert, lay the land of Egypt. To this land, Jacob's favorite son Joseph had been sold by his jealous brothers to be a slave. The story of how Joseph rose to a position of power in the land, of how his foresight made Egypt a land of plenty, of how his brothers came to Egypt to buy grain at a time of famine, and of how Joseph urged them to bring their families and their now aged father Jacob to Egypt. This story is well known. So the children of Israel uprooted themselves from the land of Canaan and trekked across the desert to the land of Goshen in Egypt. And among their possessions, would not the sacred stone of Bethel have come to? There in the land of Goshen, Jacob, reunited with his favorite son, lived for a further 15 years. But now he was an old man, ill and nearing death. 
so, as the custom was, he made arrangements to bestow his family blessings on his sons. First he called Joseph, and to him, the son who had saved his people, Jacob gave the firstborn's portion and the keeping of the stone of Israel. And when he came to bless the sons of Joseph as his heirs, he crossed his arms so that his right hand touched the younger, Ephraim. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Two centuries later, the situation of the Israelites in Egypt was very different, for a new dynasty of pharaohs had arisen who knew not Joseph and his people. Oppressed, at last they rose up under Moses and fled from Egypt across the waters of the Red Sea. This is the actual spot, hallowed in Bedouin legend, where the waters of the Red Sea parted to let them cross, but came together to engulf the pursuing Egyptians. So they came into the Sinai Desert and southwards towards Mount Sinai. There, where the coastal deserts rise towards the mountains, at Mount Sinai, Moses received from God the laws which were to give them a national identity under the one God, Jehovah. Two tablets of engraved stone henceforth preserved in that most holy of holies, the Ark of the Covenant. Wherever the people of Israel went, the Ark of the Covenant went with them. And the stone of Bethel, did not that go too? For was it not the first of the covenant witness stones? The covenant stone of Jacob, father of Israel, patriarch of the 12 tribes. 40 years, the stone shared their wanderings in the desert, where the miracles of the manna from heaven and the water from the rock sustained them. St. Paul was to understand their meaning. Brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers did eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was the anointed. Moses, his work done, was to die in the desert, but not before he had sighted the promised land. Joshua completed the reoccupation of Canaan. The 12 tribes settled, albeit uneasily, into their captured territories. At Hebron, they buried the bones of Joseph with those of his father Jacob in the plot of land that Abraham had bought from Ephron the Hittite. And at Shechem, setting up the stone as a witness, they renewed the covenant at the spot traditionally marked today by this memorial stone. Now we must let time slip away almost 500 years, years in which the loose tribal federation, beset by enemies, had in its own protection to become a single unified kingdom under warrior monarchs, Saul, David, Solomon the Wise. These were years in which the nation became powerful, prosperous, and wealthy. Years in which the tabernacle was moved to a new religious capital, Jerusalem. Then came years in which a decline set in, in which the kingdom split in two, so that the ten tribes of the north became one kingdom, taking the name of Israel, with Bethel as its sanctuary and Samaria as its capital, while the tribes to the south formed a southern kingdom, Judah, keeping both sanctuary and capital at Jerusalem. Then, finally, years in which disaster struck, first in the complete elimination of the northern kingdom by the Assyrians and the deportation of the people to become the ten last tribes of Israel. Then, as a final blow, the conquest by the Babylonians in 587 BC of the kingdom of Judah, the capture of the king, Zedekiah, the slaughter of his sons and the deportation of most of the people to Babylon. How doth the city sit solitary that was full of people. How has she become as a widow, she that was great among nations? Thus wailed Jeremiah. But Johanan, the son of Kareah, took all the remnant of Judah, men, women, and children, and Jeremiah the prophet, and the king's daughters, 
So they came into the land of Egypt. Not only did the party come to Egypt, we even know exactly where they went, to Tophanes. Tophanes, the Daphne of the Greek historian Herodotus, was in those days a major garrison and commercial center on the Pelusian arm of the Nile. Today, it is a barren mound like this, called Tel El Daphne, where the fortress, excavated by Sir Flinders Petrie, must have looked like this. The ruins are still known by the locals as Casa El Bint Yehudi, the palace of the Jews' daughter. And the king's daughters. Under Israel law, inheritance can come equally from the female line. So these little princesses were destined to carry into the future the continuity of the royal line of David, king of Israel. Did not Jeremiah, salvaging what he could from the wreck of his nation, take with him to Tophanes all that was left of the succession of Israel? Forgotten little princesses, and a stone left from the destruction of Jerusalem. The stone of Bethel, the stone of destiny. Here at Tophanes, in the early 6th century BC, the little party disappear from recorded history, but not, as we are about to see, from legend. For now, our story takes us from Egypt to another land, to an island on the edge of the then known world. Remote, it may seem, from the lands of the Mediterranean. But was it as remote as we might imagine? Let's make our way to a windswept hill crest in County Meath, to Tamar Nawi, Tara of the Kings, one of the most hallowed spots in ancient Irish history. Today, it is a proliferation of prehistoric mounds and ditches, clustered in such profusion that the imagination is stirred to a sense of the timeless sanctity of the spot. Each feature has a modern name chosen from the deep well of Celtic legend. But the secrets of each feature's true identity remain hidden, and they date from many different periods of prehistory. Thus, the tumulus, called the Mound of the Hostages, is in fact a passage grave, a tomb with a central burial chamber connected to the exterior by a tunnel or passage, and dating from several millennia BC. But, and this is the interesting fact, similar graves are found in Iberia, modern Spain. Moreover, there were found in this tomb beads of Mediterranean manufacture placed there by Bronze Age men. So here, thousands of years ago, is evidence of close cultural and trade links between Ireland and the Mediterranean. Even more impressive is the similar grave at Newgrange near Drogheda in County Meath, 280 feet in diameter, with a superb tomb entrance now restored. In front of the entrance, a later people decorated one of the stones, and the prehistoric markings they carved are those the Mycenaeans used on their tombs in Asia Minor, and the Mycenaeans are a Mediterranean people, called also Ionians, called also Milesians men of the Scythian race who appear in history from the lands to which the ten lost tribes of Israel were deported. Moreover, many times in Ireland have been uncovered hordes of ancient gold, gold ornaments fashioned from Irish gold by Celtic craftsmen, to a pattern based on the mid-European culture of Latin and Hallstatt, and traded all over the known world. Examples like these, made in Ireland, have been excavated from Gaza itself in Israel. Celtic gold in Israel, decorated stones at Drogheda with Milesian carving, passage tombs at Tara whose designs originate in Spain. These are facts of archaeology quite unknown to the tellers of Ireland's ancient history. All the more exciting, therefore, that they breathe truth and colour into those early legends which link the ancestors of the first kings of Ireland with two princes, Heber and Hedeman, who were the sons of Scota, a princess of Judah in Egypt. May not these legends enshrine ancient folk memories of the wedding of one of the princesses of Judah, whom Jeremiah brought to Egypt? Was she not Scota, who, at Tephanis, married Neil, her Milesian prince? 
The historian Herodotus tells us that the Milesian mercenaries moved on from Egypt to other Milesian colonies. Many of these are known to have been on the coast of Spain. And did not Scota and her husband travel there, taking with them the sacred relics of their people? Later, when her two sons, Heber and Hermann, left Spain to found royal dynasties in Ireland, would they not too have taken with them the sacred relics of their mother's people? And would not the Stone of Destiny have been among them? It is interesting to see what account of their arrival we glean from the legends of ancient Ireland. We learn that there arrived, some centuries before the birth of Christ, a people known as the Tuatha Dei, the people of God, who were one of the families of the Milesians, the people of Heremon and Heba. Moreover, they took to Tara a number of their sacred objects, among which was a stone they venerated as the Leofoil, the stone of destiny. There is a stone called the Leofoil at Tara today, but the identification is no more authentic than those other names which supposedly identify the antiquities of Tara. The true Leofoil did indeed rest at Tara, and on it were crowned for nearly a thousand years the royal descendants of Heremon and Heber. But the stone did not remain there. To discover what happened to it, let's look towards the most recent feature built at Tara, the banqueting hall. Once a vast arcaded hall 750 feet long, here were summoned to council by the high kings of Ireland, all the lesser kings and chieftains. And here, about the year 500 AD, approval would have been given for the Leofoil to be sent to one of the royal princes, Fergus Mor Macaac, who was to be king of all the men from Ireland, who had in the intervening years crossed the water and settled in the islands and coastal fringes of the west coast of Caledonia. So from Tara, the stone was carried northwards, past the great stone chair at Sleeve na Calach, on which prehistoric markings exist, which in age and pattern match those on the stones of the mound of the hostages at Tara. And so across the cornfields of Meath, through the richest pasture land in Europe, towards the narrow neck of water that separates Ireland from Scotland. Here at the little port of Dunseverick, on the north coast of Ireland, the stone would have been hoisted aboard ship. Its destination was an island off the coast of Caledonia, the island of St. Columba, the Isle of Iona. There, in the early 6th century AD, Fergus Moore Macaac was crowned, the first king in Caledonia of the line of Hermon. The visitor should tread softly here, for on this island of Iona, long before St. Augustine brought to Britain the tenets of the Roman Church, the spirit of Christianity flowered. And here came for their coronations not only kings of Scotland, but also of Ireland and even of Norway. And when their reign was over, many of them were brought back to Iona. And here they remain, with the silent witness of the Celtic crosses to mark their faith. As the Scots extended their sway to the mainland, the stone was taken to Dunstaffnage, and there it was to remain while the Scots kingdom widened to embrace the whole of Caledonia. Then, in 846 AD, King Kenneth II, the first king of the United Kingdom of the Picts and Scots, had the stone transported to a little hill at Schoon in Persia. And here, for the next 450 years, the later kings of Scotland were crowned, the stone forming an essential part of the ceremony. William de Richanger describes the last of these Scots coronations, about 1250 AD. John de Balliol, on the following feast of St. Andrew, and seated upon the regal stone which Jacob placed under his head when he went from Beersheba to Haran, was solemnly crowned in the church of the canons regular at Schoon. In 1296, at the Battle of Dunbar, the Scots became subject to Edward I of England. They continued to protest their independence, and 30 years later, in the Declaration of Arbroath, Robert the Bruce justified Scots' independence to the world, arguing that their line of kings was part of Milesian and Scythian dynasty of 113 kings in unbroken succession from the sons of Heber and Harriman. But the English were deaf to these proclamations. The regalia of the Scots kings, the honours of Scotland, 
had already been taken by King Edward to London, to Westminster Abbey. And there his painter, Master Walter of Durham, enclosed the stone in a wooden chair for the sum of 100 crowns. It is still there today, nearly 700 years later, although the honours of Scotland have long ago been returned. On this historic block of sandstone, the monarchs of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland have been crowned from time immemorial. On Christmas Eve, 1950, the stone was removed from under the chair and abstracted from the abbey. It turned up, of course, in Scotland on the altar stone of our Broth Abbey, and was later, at the special request of King George VI, brought back to Westminster. During the removal, the stone was found to be broken, and here are some tiny chippings taken during repair. Geological experts have been asked to compare these chippings with samples taken, unbeknown to them, from one of the beds of sandstone which outcrop among the limestone near Bethel. Here is their microscope analysis. First, sandstone from the coronation stone. And now, sandstone from Bethel. And the verdict? It is possible that the specimens could have been closely related both in space and time. Coronation stone. Bethel. An interesting verdict indeed. The present owner of the land at school in Scotland commemorates the link by breeding four-horned sheep, sheep of a breed so ancient that they would have been familiar to Abraham and Isaac, Jacob's sheep. 4,000 years ago, Jacob, father of his people Israel, laid his head on a stone and dreamed a dream in which God told him that in his seed would all the nations of the earth be blessed. The evidence of legend, tradition and history suggests that there may well be a direct line of descent to the British royal family of today. For Her Majesty the Queen is descended from James I of England, who was James VI of Scotland, a descendant of the Scots kings buried on Iona, an unbroken line of descent from Fergus Moor Macharch, who was, as a descendant of the High Kings of Ireland at Tara, himself of the royal line of Harriman son of that Scota who, as a young princess, was married to the Milesian prince Neil in Egypt. Herself, one of the princesses of Judah, who came with the prophet Jeremiah to Tephanes after the destruction of Jerusalem. And was not Jacob her ancestor? And was she not of the royal line of David? The evidence of legend, tradition and history suggests that the stone which today rests in Westminster Abbey as part of the coronation chair could well be that stone which Jacob anointed at Bethel 4,000 years ago. A stone hallowed by 4,000 years of history, priceless in its silent witness of God's everlasting covenant with his people Israel. The stone of Bethel. The stone of fate. The stone of destiny. In thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. In seeing the film, Stone of Destiny, one cannot fail to be struck with the similarities between the coronation of Britain's monarchs and that of the kings of Israel's House of David. And all the regalia used in Britain's coronation ceremonies have biblical significance. It cannot be pure coincidence that all the rituals of the coronation ceremony are a counterpart of those used in Old Testament days. I will now present a short study of coronation ceremonies of the monarchs of Britain, who sat upon the world's greatest throne 
and that someday will be occupied by our Lord Jesus Christ. Westminster Abbey in London has been the scene of the coronations of every king and queen of England since William the Conqueror. This painting shows the abbey as it may have looked in the 16th century. It has received many alterations and additions since. In the foreground, the River Thames flows under Westminster Bridge. Seen today in the center of this aerial view, the abbey is dwarfed by the House of Lords and the Parliament buildings. Westminster Abbey is a royal peculiar, meaning that it comes under the jurisdiction of a dean and a chapter who are appointed by the monarch, rather than by the Archbishop of Canterbury or the Bishop of London. The interior of the Abbey is magnificent. Its chapels and aisles are filled with monuments and memorials, and contains the tombs of most of Britain's rulers up to the 18th century. This is the choir. Like the rest of the abbey, its roof is decorated with elaborate traceries and bosses. The west front of the abbey is the entrance through which all important processions enter. Over the doorway is the famous Gothic stained glass window, known as the Israel window, portraying across the top Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Below the patriarchs are the twelve sons of Jacob, whose descendants were to be as the dust of the earth and the sand on the shores who would spread across to the west, to the east, to the south, and the north. In St. Edward's Chapel reposes the supreme symbol of sovereignty, the primeval monument that binds together the English-speaking people, the coronation stone, traditionally known as Jacob's royal stone of destiny, resting under the coronation chair. Over this stone, all the Irish, Scottish, and English monarchs, with one exception, have been crowned. Today, the stone is missing under the chair, it having been returned to Scotland, where it can be seen today in Edinburgh Castle with the other honors of Scotland. It will be returned to Westminster Abbey for all future coronations. The form, style, and composition of the coronation's opening procession to the Abbey has changed significantly over the centuries. This painting illustrates a procession of Richard I on September the 3rd, 1184. Two bishops under the canopy support the monarch to the church. As the queen enters the great west door of Westminster Abbey, they are met by the civil and ecclesiastical dignitaries who, bearing the regalia, escort them up the nave, led by the choristers who sing the anthem, taken from the 122nd Psalm composed by King David. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is at unity with itself. The preparation for the coronation commences with a litany that contains a prayer. O God, we have heard with our ears, and our fathers have declared unto us the noble works that thou didst in their days and in old times before them. At the east side of the abbey, and afterwards at the south, west, and north sides, the monarch is presented to the people, the Archbishop of Canterbury, saying, Sirs, I here present to you your undoubted king. Wherefore, all you who are come this day to do homage and service, are you willing to do the same? The people signify their assent by acclamation and cries of God save the king. We find in 1 Samuel 10, verse 24, these words. And Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. The coronation sermon is delivered either by the Archbishop of Canterbury or the Dean of the Abbey. The preaching of such a sermon absolutely originated in Israel of old. There are numerous examples of such in the Old Testament, where the prophet or the priest addressed the king and the people at the coronations. 
It is very significant that at the coronation of George III, Bishop Drummond addressed the king with these words, taken from 1 Kings 10, verse 9. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighteth in thee to set thee on the throne of Israel, because the Lord loved Israel forever. Therefore made he thee king to do judgment and justice. Following the sermon, the king or queen expresses their free will by taking the oath and promises to uphold justice in the kingdom. He or she then goes to the altar and places their right hand on the Bible, that is God's book of the law, and makes a solemn oath saying, The things which I have promised, I will perform and keep. So help me, God. After kissing the Bible, the monarch reads aloud the following statement. I do solemnly and sincerely, in the presence of God, profess, testify, and declare that I am a faithful member of the Protestant Reformed Church, by law established in England. And I will, according to the true enactments which secure Protestant succession to the throne of my realm, uphold and maintain the said enactments to the best of my powers, according to law. It is significant that in 2 Kings 11, verse 17, are these words. And Jehoiada made a covenant between the Lord and the king and the people, that they should be the Lord's people. Next in the coronation ceremony is the anointing with oil. Anointing with oil was an act which God ordained long ago as an outward sign of divine election into an office or special service. In Exodus, God commanded Moses to anoint Aaron, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. In like manner, as the monarch is seated on the coronation chair over the stone of destiny, the Archbishop of Canterbury reads the following prayer at Queen Elizabeth II's coronation in 1953. O Lord, who by anointing with oil didst of old make and consecrate kings, priests, and prophets to teach and govern thy people Israel, bless and sanctify thy chosen servant who by our office and ministry is now to be anointed with this oil and consecrated queen of this realm. Strengthen her, O Lord, with the Holy Ghost and comfort her. Following the anthem comes the most sacred moment of the whole coronation ceremony symbolizing God's choice of the sovereign of the realm to sit upon David's throne. The archbishop takes the golden spoon into which the dean of the abbey has poured some oil for the ampulla, or golden dove. And with the oil from the spoon, the archbishop anoints the monarch's head, breast and hands, three times, as he says, Be thy head anointed with holy oil. Be thy breast anointed with holy oil be thy hands anointed with holy oil. And as Solomon was anointed by Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet, so be you anointed, blessed and consecrated ruler over this people, whom the Lord hath given you to rule and govern, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Bath Abbey is a stained glass window depicting King Edgar in 973, being crowned after being anointed at his coronation. After the anointing of the monarch, there follows the delivery of the royal regalia, the royal crowns, the orb, the golden spoon, the rods and swords, the ring and the bracelet. Then follows the girding of the swords with the appointed sword of spiritual justice, or sword of state, and the curatana, or unpointed sword of mercy. These are placed on the altar to signify the monarch's intent under God to rule in justice, equity, and mercy. The sword also symbolizes the monarch's authority and his role as a leader in war. However, the two symbolic functions attached to the sword in the English coronation ritual are the defense of the church and the defense of the kingdom into the care of the king. Of all the swords that play a part in the coronation ritual, the most important one is a jeweled sword of state. The present sword was made in 1678 and has been used at the coronations of all monarchs from King George IV onward, and possibly from as early as that of James II. The introduction of spurs into the English coronation ceremony 
is believed inspired by the ritual of making a knight, which includes buckling of spurs to the heel. The golden spurs of St. George, made about 1661, were once buckled on, but now they are only touched to the sovereign's heel before being placed on the altar. The next event in the coronation ceremony is investiture of the monarch with the robe, which is also an ancient Hebrew custom. It formed part of the coronations of David's throne in 582 BC, but its first appearance was in the wilderness of Sinai after the Exodus, where the robe was one of the important garments put upon Aaron when he was anointed as high priest for Israel. In more modern times, three imperial robes are used for coronations and state affairs. This is a crimson robe of state with a cap of maintenance. The robe of purple velvet, here showing the scepter and the orb and the imperial state crown. The golden imperial mantle, here showing the scepter and the rod and St. Edward's gold crown. Behind the monarch is a coronation chair. Here we see Edward VII being crowned on the coronation chair at Westminster Abbey in 1902. This painting illustrates the three coronation robes worn by King George at his coronation ceremony in Westminster Abbey in 1911. The purple robe, the golden imperial mantle, the crimson robe. George was known as the Sailor King, having spent most of his adult career in the Navy. It was said at his coronation, seldom has a country been blessed with sovereigns who are in such sympathy with the poor as our new monarch and his consort, Queen Mary. Here he is as a midshipman aboard the Britannia. In the Grand Accession Council, with which his reign began, George paid a touching tribute to Her Majesty, Queen Mary. I am encouraged by the knowledge that I have in my dear wife, one who will be a constant helpmate in every endeavor for our people's good. This painting by Albert Collins shows King George VI wearing the purple velvet robe and holding the scepter with the crown. On the table is a coronation crown with the orb. At the same time the monarch receives the robe, he or she is given the orb, a golden sphere six inches in diameter surmounted by a cross. The symbolism of the orb, the globe of the world, dominated by the emblem of Christianity is emphasized by the archbishop when he puts it in the monarch's hand at the investiture of the royal mantle. But it is then handed back so as to leave both monarch's hands free to receive the ring and two scepters. The archbishop then says to the monarch, Receive this imperial robe and orb and the Lord endure you with majesty and with power from on high. The Lord clothe you with the robe of righteousness and with the garment of salvation. And when you see this orb set under the cross, remember that the whole world is subject to the power and empire of Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, so that no man can reign happily who derives not his authority from him and directs not all his action according to his laws. Three coronation rings are used in the coronation. The ring signifies the union of the monarch with the people that is a marriage to the nation. The symbolism of the ring has a biblical parallel. According to the biblical record, the Lord Jehovah was married to the nation of Israel. Reading from Jeremiah 3, verse 14. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. This 18th century mystical painting shows a Scottish king receiving a ring on his way to his coronation. The sovereign's ring was made for William IV. In its center is a large sapphire with a diamond surround. Over this are laid five rubies representing the cross of St. George. The queen consort's ring was made for Queen Adelaide, the wife of William IV in 1831. Queen Victoria's ring was especially made for her because her tiny fingers could not retain the larger coronation ring. Engraved within the shank are the words, Queen Victoria's Coronation Ring, 1838. It was made for Victoria's little finger, 
but the archbishop forced it on the traditional fourth finger, and it is reported that it caused her much difficulty and pain in removing it, which is probably why Her Majesty is looking a mite sour. The next step in the coronation is the presentation of the two rods to the monarch. Both rods have a small orb of the world surmounting them at the top. One is mounted with a cross above the orb and is called the scepter, which is held in the monarch's right hand. It contains a magnificent diamond, the Star of Africa. The other is mounted with a dove and is simply called the rod. The dove, symbolic of the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, is held in the monarch's left hand. Zechariah 6, verse 12 and 13 prophesies of Christ. Behold the man whose name is the branch. He shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne. A minor but very significant part of the coronation ceremony is the presentation of the bracelets to the monarch. There is a biblical precedence for the use of bracelets in the inauguration of a monarch. David has brought the bracelets and diadem worn by Saul after Saul's death. Apparently, they were not always used in English coronations. After having been invested with the emblems and insignias of royal dignity, the monarch is presented with the coronation crown of England, known today as St. Edward's crown, because it is a copy of the one used by Edward the Confessor, founder of Westminster Abbey. The crown is a chief symbol of royal power, precise detail of crowns worn by English king before the later medieval and renaissance periods are very sparse. St. Edward's crown is of pure gold. Its rim is set with 12 large stones of various colors, each surrounded by diamonds. The number and coloring of the stones are most significant. They are identical with those which God commanded Israel's high priest to wear throughout the history of Israel as a kingdom nation. Reading from Exodus 28, verse 21. And the stone shall be with the number of the children of Israel, twelve, according to their names, like the engravings of a signet. Everyone with his name shall they be according to the twelve tribes. The imperial state crown is used on various state occasions. In the center face is the black Prince Edward III's ruby, set in the middle of the cross. Beneath it is the famous second star of Africa, cut in the Cullinan diamond. When the royal crown is placed upon the monarch's head, the archbishop gives a final benediction, praying to God, saying, O God, who crownest thy faithful servant with mercy and loving kindness, look down upon this thy servant, our sovereign, who now in lowly devotion bowest her head to thy divine majesty, and as thou dost this day set a crown of pure gold upon her head, so enrich her royal heart with thy heavenly grace, adorn the high station wherein thou hast placed her through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be honor and glory forever. A final act of the coronation is a homage paid to the new sovereign by the people, as seen in this painting of King George VI receiving homage. This is no modern ceremony as we have seen, for in the days of the first king chosen to reign over God's kingdom race, Israel of old. We read in 1 Samuel 10, verse 24, And Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among the people. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. The symbols of sovereignty, the crowns, scepters, swords, Spurs, bracelets, rings, spoon, and pulla or golden dove. The coronation itself is rooted in the Old Testament history. All are visible evidences of God's promise to King David that his throne would endure forever, as we find recorded in Psalms 89, verse 3 and 4. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant, thy seed will I establish forever, and build up thy throne to all generations.